Thank you, Matt. Thank you, choir. Our scripture reading this morning is found from the book of Luke, chapter 15. I call it the book of Luke. I actually prefer referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Gospels. So I should have said, if I may repeat, our scripture reading this morning is from the good news that Luke shares with us, chapter 15. Will you please stand for the reading of God's word from the good news of Luke? And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent unto him his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a far way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no more worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Thank you. You may be seated and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. What a wonderful passage of scripture this parable of Jesus is. It almost leaves me wanting to start there and preach on that. But I remember that our series concerns Jesus the Christ. And we are deciding that Christ's ministry is to be understood, that is his earthly ministry, and even his heavenly ministry and future ministry is to be understood as that of the Christ, the anointed one, the special one of God. And what is it that makes him the Christ? Messiah is the Old Testament term. What makes him the promised deliverer? It is his function. And he functions perfectly as prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king. John Calvin was the one who in the 1500s put forth the term the offices of Christ. Prophet, priest, and king. I have a a um, systematic theology in my library by a contemporary scholar named Millard Erickson, and it is a good one. And he says that we should, while it's okay to use that term, we probably should use the term the functions of Christ. Because as we know in our day and time, it's possible for a person to have an office and just to sit there and do nothing. But when we say the functions of Christ, we're talking about his active engagement in doing these things and in fulfilling these roles. And so, with the tip of the hat to Lord Erickson, I'm using the phrase, the functions of Christ. But I may slip back into some old patterns and use the offices of Christ as well. If I do, you'll remember that Jesus is doing this He's not just occupying an office and sitting on his hands. And one of those functions is as the prophet, the prophet of God. Last week we looked at those prophecies from Moses. So someday a prophet will come and you will listen to him because what he says is truly of God. And we looked at that scripture from Hebrews chapter 1, which the book begins in verses 1 and 2 by telling us God, who at different times and in various ways spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. 
has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and by whom he also made the world. Jesus is the great prophet, mentioned by Moses, but greater than Moses. That's what Moses said, one greater than me, a greater prophet than me. In Israel today, the Jewish people regard Moses as the greatest of their prophets. But Jesus is superior. A prophet forth tells. It's easy to remember the function of a prophet and the function of a priest by remembering that a prophet brings God to the people and a priest brings the people to God. A prophet comes forth with a message from God. This is what God wants you to hear. This is the message God gave me. And in the Old Testament, prophetic offices, those who were prophets, they frequently prefaced their remarks with the phrase, thus saith the Lord, meaning God gave me this message to pass on to you. So a prophet forth tells. He brings forth the message from God. And in bringing forth that message from God, there is quite often, if not always, a message of consequences to whether you believe or not believe. If you believe God's word and act upon it, then you may expect blessing. If you choose to continue in your unbelief and in your sinful conduct without repentance, without obedience, then you may expect heartache, severity, judgment, sorrow. So God's message is always a message of life. Jesus, in functioning as the prophet, brings us the message from God. As I mentioned last week, he is the message from God. His life speaks volumes. His deeds speak of God. But he did have a message regarding the Lord, Yahweh. The Lord, the covenant-making God. When Moses asked, who are you? And the Lord says, I am. We know he's identifying himself as a person, among other things. A person. A person who wishes to relate to Moses. A person who wishes to relate to Israel. A person who wishes to relate even to Pharaoh. And a person who in the past, prior to Moses, had related to Adam, to Abram, to Joseph. He is the covenant-making God. He enters into relationships with people. He is a person. What kind of person is this Lord? The message of Jesus is twofold regarding God, his character, and how we may expect him to conduct himself. And that message about God the Father is this. God is first holy and then just. Holy and just. The word holy means set apart, different, separate. Most of us who have a Bible with us this morning will look on the binding and see that it says holy Bible. Bible is simply a word that means book. In this case, a collection of books. These are the holy books. They are set apart from all other writings. They're set apart from even the great philosophic writings. Those of Socrates and Kant, they're set apart, these books, from other books of literature, either fiction or nonfiction, because this book speaks of God. It tells us who God is. It tells us what God is like. It tells us what we are like and how we may know God and our need for God. It speaks of Jesus, our deliverer, our Christ, who came to show us what God is like and to tell us what God expects from us. And the message of Jesus is this. God is holy 
He is untarnished by sin. He is set apart from his creation. He is set apart from you. Yes, he is a person. Yes, he thinks. Yes, he feels. He grieves. He laughs. Psalm 2 says, the Lord will laugh at the arrogance of man who think they can get by without him. He laughs. He grieves. He thinks. He loves. He hates. He has emotional content. He is a person. But he's not like you and me. He's totally untarnished by sin. He never thinks a thought of sin. He never wills to sin. He is consistent in his holy character. He always thinks what's right and he always does what's right called righteousness. He practices right according to his own standard. God is holy, untarnished by sin, holy in an absolute sense. Jesus twice cleansed the temple. At the beginning of his earthly ministry and at the conclusion of his earthly ministry, he went up to the Passover. He entered the temple. And there in that temple he saw a disgusting sight, an unholy sight. People selling animals at inflated prices for sacrifice, animals that had been approved by the rabbis, Sanhedrin, and sold at inflated prices as a way of making money. He saw their money changers exchanging the foreign currency of those Jews who had pilgrimed to Jerusalem for the worship at the Passover, and cheating them, really, because they couldn't exchange their money out in Jerusalem. They had to exchange it for the temple currency. Jesus drove them out of the temple in fury with these words. My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Sin will not stand in God's presence. He will not have it. Rather, he will judge it. And that's what we mean by just. Sin will be judged. There was another occasion in the life of Jesus, the prophet. When, in ministering around the Sea of Galilee, he had performed some of his greatest miracles, preached some of his greatest sermons. And still, the people chose not to believe. And to these people, Matthew 11, Jesus says this, Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Bethsaida, if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes, visible and outward manifestations of an inward sorrow for sin and of a repentant attitude. But I tell you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment, God is just, than for you. And you, Capernaum, Capernaum of all places. When Jesus became an adult and began his public ministry, he settled in Capernaum. This became his hometown. His residence was in Capernaum. And there he ministered. And there outside of Capernaum, he fed the 5,000, or at least that's where the traditional site is located and preach one of his great sermons on himself being the bread of life. Believe in him and live. 
and never hunger again. And you, Capernaum, he goes on to say, you will be lifted up. You think you'll be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, of all places of reference, Sodom. No more disgusting or repugnant town in the history of the Old Testament could have been pulled out of the file to use against Capernaum. But Jesus says, if the miracles that had been performed in you, Capernaum, had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. The implication is they would have remained they would have understood their sin and they would have repented before God to avoid his judgment. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day, but I tell you it will be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment. That's pretty powerful. And the power behind those words is this. God is holy. Sin will be judged. He is a just God. He also denounced the Pharisees and the scribes for their self-righteous behavior. In Matthew chapter 10, he says this, do not be afraid of him who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Be afraid? Fear the judgment. Jonathan Edwards, who's considered by many to be the greatest evangelist in the history of America, in spite of names like Billy Sunday, Dwight Moody, Billy Graham, Jonathan Edwards fathered the Great Awakening in America with one powerful sermon that he repeated as he traveled New England. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. So we fear God and his judgment because he is holy and we are not. But there was another aspect to Jesus' teaching. It wasn't just on the holy and just nature of God. It was also on his loving and gracious nature. And that takes us to one of the most famous and most beloved parables of Jesus, that known as the prodigal son. We know that this parable teaches us about God who is symbolized by the Father. And the repentant sinner, which I hope all of us are, symbolized by the younger son and those who insist on self-righteousness, symbolized by the older son who is castigated for it. God is full of love and grace. The story is familiar. That is the story of the prodigal son. The young son, in a moment of distastefulness and complete rebellion, says to the father, I want my inheritance now, which as some commentators have said was the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead, old man. That's what I think of you. And while those are the the comments of the commentators and not the comments of Jesus, it's probably a true reflection of the attitude of the younger son. And so the father complies and gives him his inheritance. He goes out and wastes it in what uh, scriptures Jesus calls riotous living, a phrase that leaves a lot to the imagination. And probably whatever you imagine is included in that phrase is right. That's why we have this general phrase given. Anything he could do that was sinful, he did. Anything he could do that was wrong, he did. Anything he could do that was against his upbringing, he did. And he soon found himself broke, with no friends, living in poverty, hungry, 
and feeding swine in a foreign country. So he gets up. He returns to the father. And we pick up the story in verses 21 and 22 where the prodigal son has returned to the father. And in a spirit now of repentance and in a spirit of grace, the son and the father confer the son. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Jesus has taught on the holy and the just nature of God. And now he's teaching that holy and that just nature we can prepare to meet through admitting our guilt, admitting our sin, and seeking his grace. And now the Father full of grace and love, says to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and kill the fatted calf here and let us eat and be merry. Let's have a party. For this my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and now is found. That's the heart of the father. The heart of the father toward the one who chooses to continue in sin is one of judgment. Judgment will come. But the heart of the Father toward the one who turns in faith and repentance to him is one full of grace and full of love. After all, John 3.16 reminds us in what is probably the most familiar verse in the entire Bible, for God so loved the world. Now take a moment and in your mind, just scratch out the world and put your name there instead. Just put your own name there. For God so loved What's your name? Put it there. That he gave his only begotten son, that if you will believe in him, you will not perish, but have everlasting life. Bring out the best robe, the father says. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. All of these, all of these items express that the father has fully reconciled the son back into the family and back to himself. Put on the best robe. Isaiah 61 tells us that our sins are as filthy rags before God, but the phrase is used, he will put a robe of righteousness on us. That robe of righteousness comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. His Righteousness is imputed to our account. Romans 5 teaches us we have his righteousness. We are robed and clothed. And then put the ring on his finger. Well, the ring of a sovereign or the ring of a father was used to express signature, authority. A ring was taken and put in hot wax and then used to seal documents by the king. Pharaoh in uh, chapter 41 of Genesis calls Joseph into his presence and Pharaoh hands his ring to Joseph and says, now whatever he tells you to do, do it. Meaning Joseph has the authority of Pharaoh to act on his behalf. The ring is put on the son's finger, meaning you now have authority. You now have power that you did not have before. Once we are robed in the righteousness of Christ, the Holy Spirit who indwells us gives us an authority, a power that we did not have before, and that power is to live out that righteousness in our decisions and in our conduct. The book of Ephesians speaks of the authority we have in Christ. Sit, walk, stand, a very simple outline to Ephesians, which only consists of six chapters, but they're six powerful chapters. It all begins with us, chapter 1 of Ephesians, being told that we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. That's a position of authority. And chapter 4 says, now walk in imitation of God. The word translated, be imitators of God, imitate. 
is mine. You all know what a mime is. I'm sure you've seen it on television. A mime has his face painted white and the features blackened and says no words, just acts out a skit. And that's what Ephesians 4 tells us we need to do as imitators of God, be mimes of God. Do what Jesus would do if he were here today. Be little Jesuses wherever you go in the world. Be imitators of God, mimes of God. We have the power to do so because we've been given the ring, the authority, the presence of the Holy Spirit within to empower us to live out our position. And then Ephesians, by the way, since I've talked about sit, sitting in the heavenlies, stand, uh, walking in the world as mimes of God, I might as well finish that. Stand in the whole armor of God. Yeah, there will be times you need to fight for what's right. Do it in the power of God, and you will not fail. But getting back here, these all symbolize for us full and complete forgiveness and reconciliation. Oh, the sandals on the feet. Slaves were barefoot. A master, a landowner, wore shoes. And so the Father has complete forgiveness, complete reconciliation. The Son is totally forgiven. In fact, the Son's conversation his words to the Father are interrupted by the Father. He's starting to go on and begin to tell him all the bad things. That the Father says, I don't want to hear it. Stop. I can tell from your attitude that you've come for forgiveness. And I grant it to you. With this parable, familiar Kind as it is, Jesus reminds us as the prophet that God is holy and just, but he is also loving and gracious and will receive us to himself. His forgiveness is full. His reconciliation is complete. Here's what I'd like to say in conclusion. The Messiah functions as prophet, priest, and king. That's what makes him the Messiah, the Christ. The prophetic message of Jesus is that God will deal with each person either in mercy and grace or in judgment, depending upon how you respond to the gospel. And the gospel is the good news that Jesus paid the price for your sin. He has redeemed us. He is your substitute. John 3.16 by accepting him, you are completely forgiven and reconciled to the Father. Have you come to Christ as he paid the price for your sin? Let us pray. And as we go to prayer this morning, perhaps there are friends here today who have not yet made a commitment of faith to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. We would not want to close the service without an opportunity being given you to invite Christ by faith into your life. The message of the prophet, as Jesus fulfills that function, is God is holy. Sin will be judged. The good news is it was judged in Jesus for us. He's our substitute if we will believe and accept. And if so, then the love and the grace of God is poured upon us abundantly. We are fully reconciled to our Lord God. If you're here and you don't have that assurance or that hope or that knowledge, in a few moments we're going to close our service with the singing of a gospel song, Change My Heart, O God. And as we do so, we invite you to come from where you'll be standing to walk to the front of this worship center where I will greet you and someone will show you from the Bible how you may become a Christian, how you may have the hope that Christ gives, both in this life and for the world to come. If you're here and you've made that commitment of faith to Christ and would like to become part of our church family, then we invite you to come as well. Lord Jesus Christ, we come through you to God the Father and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
acknowledging that God is holy, that justice will prevail, that sin will be judged, yes, our own sin as well. This makes us fearful. But the knowledge that you have paid the price for our sin and that through faith in you we are in God's standing just as if we had never sinned. Fully forgiven and reconciled. Sons and daughters of the Lord, filled with his spirit and empowered to live victorious lives that excites and fuels us. I pray today that our friends here today with needs in their lives, that they will feel the freedom to respond as we sing. And this I ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Let us stand together as we sing. If you can respond this morning. Sunday morning, the Blackwood Brothers Quartet will be here, and next Sunday night, they'll be doing a full concert. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to invite friends to come with you and introduce them to the ministry God has given us here at the chapel. Let us pray, and we'll bring our service to a close. Dear Father, today we give you thanks that through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the Lord Jesus Christ alone, we are accepted in in the heavens by God. We give you thanks that we are able to call upon Christ, to follow after Christ, to be one with Christ, to know that we fellowship with Christ and someday we will spend eternity with Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen.